morning. Today we have assembled to witness the seventh in series invited talk jointly organized by the Indian Nuclear Society INS Hyderabad chapter and Atomic Minerals Directorate for Exploration Research, AMD Hyderabad, as part of ongoing nationwide celebrations of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav 2021 to promote Atmanirvarta in science. I, on behalf of Atomic Minerals Directorate for Exploration and Research, extend a warm welcome to the chief guest of today's afternoon, an eminent physicist, Padmashri Dr. Rohini Godbole, honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Science, IISC Bangalore. I also welcome Sri N. Sai Baba, former CE NFC and RRF AMD, Director AMD and a Chairman INS Hyderabad Chapter, Dr. D.K. Sinha, Additional Director Operationsman Sri B. Sarvanan, Additional Director Research and Development and Secretary INS Hyderabad Chapter, Dr. T.S. Sunil Kumar, Additional Director OPS 2, Sri R. Marmalan, who's connected with us virtually. Today, all the regional directors, deputy regional directors who are present with us physically and connected virtually, all the group heads, in charges, senior scientists and officers who are present with us physically and connected virtually, the INS members from different parts of country attending today's webinar through the virtual mode, and also the students and faculty members from the schools and colleges who are attending the virtual through the virtual platform. A very good afternoon to this graceful and intellectual gathering. As mentioned a few moments ago, today we have an interesting invited talk, Mega Science Projects, Relevance of and for India, which is the seventh lecture in a series. And prior to this, we have witnessed many informative, scientific enlightening webinar talks on nuclear technology, space technology, oncology, earth sciences, to name a few, from eminent scientists, professors of a country, and their contribution towards self-reliance, Atmanirvarta in science. Before we move ahead into the webinar, I would like to request our Honorable Director, Dr. D.K. Sinhasa, to the stage to deliver his welcome address to the gathering. Namaskar. Today's chief guest, Padmasri of Professor Rohini M. Godbole, Center for High Energy Physics, Indian Institute of Science, and dignitaries from DA units who are connected virtually. Many are connected through YouTube. Uh, physically present here, former CNFC, Dr. Sai Baba, Dr. T. Srinivas, who is also connected through virtual mode. Of course, he could not come physically. And my colleagues, additional directors, who are physically available, uh, Sri Sarvanan, Dr. Srinil Kumar, Sri Mamlan is uh, virtually connected. INS office bearers and members, uh, now the, fac the facility of uh, virtual connection is available. They are watching this program uh, by um, YouTube are through WebEx. And many students and faculty members to whom we have provided the links, they are connected virtually all over the country. As uh, we know that AMD is uh, available in many places, many locations. So we have used our contact to share this uh, web link for this interesting science talk. As uh, already informed that uh, we have uh, we are continuing with uh, this uh, type of series, and this is the seventh uh, webinar of the Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav series, 2021, continuing in 2022. And we know that uh, 75 years of Indian, India's independence is being celebrated by, by various programs. And this is one program which INS, Hyderabad chapter, and AMD has formulated, and we are doing this uh, uh, lecture series every month by inviting eminent scientist who has established in his field or in her field in science, and we 
see that contribution in our 75th years of independence. In accordance uh, with the guidelines received from DAE for the celebration of Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahosav, we have planned this uh, series and we have widely circulated this series to the students so that the benefit of such type of uh, lecture should uh, infiltrate to the college, to the students, probably that type of uh, lecture or this type of uh, series are uh, uh, very difficult to get uh, a senior officer or senior scientist for such type of lectures and as a part of INS program and part of AMD program, we are continuing with this uh, uh, series. As we know that uh, Dr. Padmasri Professor Rohini M. Godwole has accepted our this uh, request. We know that uh, she is a very busy person. Uh, once I could get a message that uh, 9 p.m. she was taking class. So one can understand that at this age of probably plus 70 years, she is taking class at 9 p.m. Really, ma'am, I was impressed with your message and uh, I thought that uh, this is the message which should be shared across the uh, platform. Everybody should know that this type of dedication is required to touch the height what uh, Madam has achieved. And Ma'am has accepted one more request that she will be talking on some other topic that is a very relevant topic in some other day, we'll be inviting again. Madam, if possible, we'll, we'll uh, welcome you at AMD Hyderabad, if possible. Otherwise, virtual platform is always available for your second lecture. And for that, everybody is very much uh, looking forward to the subject, uh, which is uh, her uh, expertise in addition to this uh, science uh, business. Uh, she is a very vocal and has written many things for inclusive in inclusivity and many aspects uh, related to uh, science and women, many things are there. When I went to your uh, biodata, really, I was uh, impressed with that idea. <laughs> so uh, we are happy in AMD that uh, you have given us time and you will be speaking on this. And at this occasion, I welcome you for a very uh, scintillating lecture on mega science project. The topic itself is a very, very important and uh, gives a different taste. We talk uh, science, but uh, we have to say, think for mega science. In India, mega science is a very, very important uh, subject which has emerged recently, and we have seen many exhibitions. Of course, DA has also participated in those, ex uh, in those exhibitions. AMD as a part of that uh, was involved in uh, Bangalore, Delhi, and other places. So. Uh, listening on mega science project is going to be a real uh, interesting item for today's talk. We are grateful to our respected chairman, AC, Secretary DAE, who has given us uh, this uh, uh, guidance and uh, platform for conducting this. And as uh, uh, every time I say that this series is getting documented, transcribed, and we have completed the last lectures the last lecture of January month uh, of uh, Professor Deepankar Chatterjee in a form of transcription. It has gone to him and then the series will be printed in a form of nice memoir containing all the lectures which have been uh, presented in this uh, seminar. So with this, I once again welcome Professor Rohini Godbole for this lecture. Thank you, ma'am, for giving us time. So, the director. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, as a director, sir, has already mentioned, uh, today we have with us renowned personality in the field of elementary particle physics. She needs no introduction, but for the benefit of the August gathering, let's have a brief glimpse of her achievements. Professor Rohini M. Godbole, currently honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, is a theoretical particle physicist. She retired from the Center for High Energy Physics of the IISC after serving as professor for 25 years. She was earlier at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and has also worked 
at a number of universities in India, such as Mumbai University, and Europe, and the USA, including CERN, Geneva. Her research over past 40 decades on exploring the standard model of particle physics and physics beyond the standard model has resulted in over 300 publications in journals as well as graduate textbooks. Her work regarding the hadronic structure of high energy photons pointed out the dominance of an entirely new class of process that could yield directly invaluable information about the structure and started off the physics program of resolved photon processes at Hadron Electron Ring Accelerator, HERA. This work had an important implication for the design of next generation electron positron colliders. She suggested innovative ways to search for the top quark Higgs bosons and other new particles at the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, and at the International Linear Collider, ILC. A fellow of the World Academy of Science, she has been elected to the three science academies of India. She has served as Vice President of Indian National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad. She is and has been a member to different national and international advisory bodies, such as Scientific Advisory Body to the Cabinet, SAC, the High Energy Physics Advisory Panel of the USA, to name a few. Her collaborative research initiatives are founding of the Indian Linear Collider Working Group and ILC India Forum, Indo-US projects with the University of Hawaii, Indo-US Center for BSM Physics with the University of Hawaii, University of Madison, USA, new particle production at current and future colliders. She is recipient of many prestigious awards. She has been conferred the fourth highest civilian Padma Shri by Government of India for her contributions to science and technology in 2019. Satyendranath Bose Medal for Theoretical Physics in 2009 from Indian National Science Academy. Meghnath Saha Memorial Gold Medal for Physics from Asiatic Society of Kolkata in 2007. To her credit, she has also been conferred the, a prestigious award, the Order of Merit, by the French government. She is the chair of the Panel for Women in Science Initiative of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Apart from her work, in academics, Goat Bully is also a much sought after communicator of science, often delivering talks to young students, scholars, and scientists on everything physics. She is also an avid supporter of women pursuing careers in science and technology. The list goes on, ma'am. With this brief introduction, I would like to invite Professor Rohini Goat Bully to this virtual platform to deliver her talk on mega science projects, relevance of and for India. Madam, the audience are eager to listen to your talk. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. So Dr. Sinha, Dr. Sunil Kumar, as well as all the various dignitaries that are present online and offline, I am very thankful to you for taking time out for listening to me. So and I'm actually quite happy to be talking about this subject that I've chosen, namely Mega Science Project, in this discussion of Atmanirbhata. And I want to actually indicate how the participation in mega projects in India, in fact, will contribute and enhance the Atmanirbhata that we are all uh, sort of keen on achieving. So let me begin by sharing my screen. And I hope the screen is uh, full. Uh, I hope just let me know if it's full, full screen. OK. And can everybody see this? I'm hoping that you can. So yeah, I, I saw your hand. OK, thank you. So as I said, I'm going to be talking about mega science projects, relevance of India for the mega science projects, which are not based in India, and relevance of these projects for India, for the science, as well as its technology. So what I will do is I will first give a few generalities about what is meant by mega projects. 
then I would tell you which particular mega science projects I'm going to be talking about and in what sense they are mega projects. And then I would actually spend a major time in talking about and explaining to you what are the scientific quests that drive these projects and why the projects need to be mega. And this I will do dominantly for particle physics, but all the three mega projects that I'm going to be discussing are somehow related to the same theme. Then I would go and tell you a little bit of an historical perspective of India's participation in all the mega projects on which we are now embarking. And then I will talk about, as I said, relevance of India to these mega projects and relevance of the mega projects to India and Indian science. And this means Indian science and technology. And maybe very briefly about what do we need to do? How do we prioritize these projects? So, you know, in general, when we think of scientific research, there are what we can call two kinds of research or two types of research. One is basic research, which is really curiosity driven and says, I want to understand how some things work. And in fact, I would say that historically, the development of science and technology in human society has been actually driven by that. Whether it was experimental or theoretical, it was driven by curiosity. And, you know, historically, I mean, I'm talking from the time of Newton or before. So historically, you know, small groups were involved, individuals were involved. But slowly what has happened is that the nature of some of these basic scientific queries, which arise out of curiosity, actually have shifted the experiments out of the reach of a single group, a single university, or a single laboratory, or even a single country. And that is why it has led to global large-scale projects which require collaborative participation of countries, not just financially, but also technologically. And these are the mega projects which are driven by science. Then there is applied research, where what we do is that we apply and broaden available scientific knowledge to specific technological goals. You know, the advantages of any expenditure that we spend for uh, science and uh, society and, uh, you know, and the state are actually very, very obvious and usually that is not questioned. So examples in the Indian context of such projects are a large number of mega projects by ISRO, by DAE and by DRDO many of which we read about and, you know, we are very proud of. For example, ISRO launched satellites. First, maybe for defense purposes, but then it used it for the societal and educational applications. And now those capabilities are being used for basic science research, such as Astrosat, Chandrayaan, Mangalayan. The Department of Atomic Energy, to which many of you belong, you know very well, that Department of Atomic Energy has made strides in nuclear power, nuclear weapons, for example, fast breeder reactor, nuclear medicine, and if nothing else, now also the fusion power, which actually, for example, I know that DAE uh, is very heavily involved in uh, materials research so that one can use materials in the um, projects which are trying to build a artificial sun on this earth, which is the fusion uh, energy. So those are the kinds of mega projects that uh, uh, also are there. And now I want to, so there are two types, as I said, two types of mega projects. And I am going to be talking about the mega projects that India at, at present is engaged or is preparing to engage in mega projects that arise out of our need to answer some basic curiosity questions. And there are three types, three subjects, which every area is. One is in the subject of particle physics, where, uh, you know, the physics at the high energy particle colliders is actually an area 
at the forefront of uh, research right now. And we all have read about the Large Hadron Collider, the accelerator, the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, and in general, CERN in Geneva. And these actually are the explorations at the laws of nature which function at the heart of matter. Then the second mega project that I will talk about is Indian Neutrino Observatory. This is IANO, and it's a home-based indigenous project that Indian physicists have thought about and are working very uh, vigorously towards it. This will explore, new, uh, you know, this is uh, supposed to do explorations in neutrino physics and therefore perhaps look for existence of possible new interactions or new particles, as well as getting a better understanding of phenomena which uh, are what, uh, what we call astrophysical that uh, happens in the cosmos or that happens in the universe, etc. Now, this is the Large Hadron Collider Tunnel and this is the Large Hadron Collider uh, Magnet to which I will come to you where India has made some important contributions and I will mention that in a little while. Then this is the one of the detectors of the experiments. Oh, sorry, what happened? Something went wrong, one second. Uh, I'm sure I'm I'm seeing some other screen. Can you check that for me? I'm not seeing my own screen. Uh, can I have some feedback? Oh uh, yes, ma'am. Are you able uh, to so see my? Just screen? give us a moment, ma'am. I think there is some problem. Yeah. Now you should be able to see my screen, I hope. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there was some problem. I don't know what it was. Okay. So the second one that I'm showing you is the CMS detector. And this is the experiment, uh, one of the experiments that happens at the Large Hadron Collider, which, for example, found the evidence for the Higgs boson. And in the construction of the CMS detector, just to give you the idea of the gigantic size, here is a human being, okay? And here are some more human beings. So you can realize how huge the detector is. And India has had taken some share in, uh, in fact, constructing this detector. Then there is this planned INO detector. And this I will thank uh, the Dr. Satya Narayana of TIFR. And this is actually the planned INO detector. And you can see that this is a height of a five-story building. And each, this consists of these uh, ray, uh, layers and layers of iron sheets. In between, there are these so-called RPC, the uh, detectors. And uh, this is something that will be indigenously completely built in India. It has been already designed. And here on this side, I show you the underground laboratory of the INO project. And uh, where you can see uh, what is uh, being planned, it will be in a tunnel and this entire uh, sub object would be uh, underneath in the tunnel and it will do many other things than detect neutrons. Now in astrophysics and astronomy, we are also embarking on the laser interferometry, interferometry gravitational observatory, LIGO India. This will do gravitational wave observations and study the physics of high gravitational fields, including the one, uh, the one that of the black holes. Then there is square kilometer array or SKA as it is called. This is a radio telescope and it is the next step in radio astronomy beyond the giant meter wave radio telescope in India, which actually has been functioning for many decades now and which is near Pune. So LIGO, this is sort of an artist's conception of what it will be uh, when it is actually uh, constructed. It's approved by Union Cabinet in February 17, 2016. Site has been acquired and this is now in construction phase. And these arms, just to give you an idea, are each four kilometer long and they are required to measure a displacement of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. And you really need the cutting edge laser technology. And as you can see here, RR CAT is uh, heavily involved as a result of that in this exercise. Then there is a last one, but the not the least, is the SKA, square kilometer array. And that's going to be array of radio antennas. And India, in fact, is quite a 
uh, expert in building these radio antennas and that's what are used in our GMRT, Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope near Pune. But now this is going to be a mega version of this GMRT and uh, this is what is supposed to be uh, set up in Australia and South Africa because these are radio quiet regions, so away from human habitat, etc. And uh, in fact, it will in fact uh, take up a space uh, over a distance, you know, antennas which are spread out over a distance of about 1000 kilometers. So this is really a huge area that will be covered. But the whole point is that this requires cutting edge science and the science that it will explore is really in the frontline areas of astrophysics where India has a lot of expertise, as I will tell you, and several next generation technologies from electronics to optical fiber data transport to sophisticated signal processing, high performance computing, big data, AI and ML for data analysis and interpretation. So our contributions here are going to help us, in fact, in developing all these cutting edge techniques in India. So what is common to all these projects? All these projects address fundamental questions about secrets of nature. Then all these projects need cutting edge technology and they have led to new developments in the, in, you know, in the technology. All are huge projects. All need global participation and no one group, no one institute or any one country has either the intellectual or monetary resources to do it alone. So now I'm going to tell you in each case, what is the history of India's participation in the science area and the science that the, we are doing uh, in these four mega projects. But let me first talk in some detail about the scientific quests that are going to drive all these three, four big projects that I'm going to take, talk to you about. So you know, what is the science driver? What are the bricks and mortar of edifice of life? This is really the question that has been driven the development of science in all the centuries. And the answers we have given to this question have changed. And our perception of what the parts are has changed as our understanding how the parts are put together has grown. And as I said, efforts to answer this question has been actually the development of science. And from the idea of the Greeks or the Indian sages who talk, talked about uh, uh, Panchamahabhutas, from those elements, we came to Mendeleev's chemical elements, then we came to molecules, we came to atoms, we thought them as fundamental, then we thought nuclear were fundamental objects, and uh, uh, you know, many of you work very closely with nuclear technologies and nuclear physics, but then we found that very soon that nuclei were also not fundamental, then there were neutrons and protons. And finally, we found that neutrons and protons are actually made up of, you know, quarks and leptons. And that is the subject of elementary particle physics. And we know that these are the fundamental objects. So the fundamental objects are the uh, leptons and quarks, which are called matter fermions. And they interact with each other also through four fundamental forces. And I will talk only about the three of, the, uh, actually I'll talk about all four of them. And the force carriers are usually, not usually, the force carriers are actually uh, uh, particles with integral spins whom we call bosons. The photon, the WZ boson, the gluon, which interact the electromagnetic, the weak and the strong interaction. And the final piece of the puzzle, the Higgs boson. And last but not the least, which is now becoming an extreme area of acute investigation, the graviton, which would, we believe, mediates the gravitational interaction. Now, what is interesting is that the laws of physics which govern the behavior of these elemental blocks, which now we have known for about a century and a little bit more, allow us to predict behavior of all matter in all conditions in principle. So where did the story begin? The story began in 1897 and the electron was born in a small tabletop experiment with a very high vacuum cathode ray tube in 1897. Now what happened from here? After that, in a few years, in 1911, 
Rutherford actually performed the scattering experiment, which shaped the physics of the century, actually, and which made a huge advance in our understanding of matter. And this came from a very simple experiment where Rutherford hit alpha particles in a thin gold foil and then measured what were the alpha particles that were arriving at different, different angles with respect to this. And the angles, you know, this you could have this detector, which was a zinc sulfide screen and a microscope. The uh, alpha particles would hit the zinc sulfide screen and they will produce a scintillation, which was actually seen by this microscope in a darkened room. And this assembly could be moved anywhere. So you could study this at all angles with respect to this target. And lo and behold, as you all of know, what happened was that the number of particles, which some of them, alpha, most of the alpha particles went through undeflected, but some actually rebounded. And using the knowledge of classical mechanics and electrodynamics, which was available in 1911, Rutherford actually concluded from this observation that atom actually has a point like nucleus. I would not go into that, but that's what this experiment did, how this happened. So since the 1911 into the first scattering experiment, what has happened is that uh, the nuclear physicists, atomic physicists, particle physicists have essentially done experiments of this scattering experiments where there is a beam, there is a target, and there is a detector. And in fact, by using higher and higher energy particle beams, one has actually been able to probe structure of matter at smaller and smaller distances. Here is a meter stick, which shows you how we see distances at uh, objects of different sizes. When you want to see galaxies, indeed we use the radio telescope that I'm going to talk to you about. If we want to see planets, actually a telescope is good enough. If we want to see a dog size or other human being, just our own eye has enough resolution. But if I want to see a plant cell, then I need to go to a microscope where which will have a higher resolution and which will be able to see smaller objects. But if I want to see still smaller objects, let's say at the distance scale of 10 to the minus 8 meters, then I need an electron microscope. But an atom, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters and smaller, electron microscope, I cannot really see the uh, atom. You need a field electron microscope there. And then the nucleus, which is what was seen in Rutherford scattering experiment as a point-like object, is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. So it's a really small object. And after that, that level, you start using this uh, scattering experiments. And now at LHC, we are using the accelerators as our microscopes. So the tools we use to measure sizes of objects actually change with the sizes that the objects have. And by increasing the energy or uh, increase, uh, the lowering the wavelengths, we have been able to increase the resolving power of our tools as we have gone here from the giant radio uh, meter wave radio telescopes to finally accelerators, the Large Hadron, uh, electro, uh, Large Hadron Collider, which actually looks at structures which are smaller than 10 to the minus 16 meters or even smaller 10 to the minus 18 meters. The beginnings were actually very, very humble. This is the first a man-made accelerator. This is the cockcroft Walton accelerator, which actually fitted inside a room in 19... This was something that was built in 1931. And some versions of Van de Graaff generators actually even in India exist for material science research and uh, uh, nuclear physics research in uh, Delhi or the, you know, the, these are the pellatrons which exist in Delhi or which exist in TIFR Bombay, for example. Now, on the side of it, uh, in, our, in another year or two, people actually constructed very small accelerators. And this was the first cyclotron, which was 4.5 inches, built in 1933 by Lawrence and Livingston. And then it in, then there's another one with a size 11 inches could accelerate particles to an energy of 1,000 million electron volts, uh, 1 million electron volts, and that is... Uh, 100,000 electron volts and electron volt is the energy that the electron gains when it falls to a potential difference of one volt. But 
as life went on and the accelerators uh, uh, needed to have more and more energy, they became much bigger. And this is the Tevatron uh, Van de Graaff generator in uh, the lab in uh, Fermi National Laboratory near uh, Chicago. And this is, of course, the Large Hadron Collider Tunnel that I already showed you, which has a circumference of 27 kilometers. All right. So now why do we need the higher energy? The higher energy is one aspect is actually looking deeper inside the matter, as I already told you. But actually, there is another aspect. As time went along, the colliders and the fixed target machines results did not find any substructure smaller than the quarks and leptons uh, at higher and higher energies and smaller and smaller distances. But the higher energies actually found evidence for newer and heavier particles and newer interactions which were predicted by the theories which were constructed based on the results of the earlier machines. So these higher energies and the precision measurements actually required bigger and more complex detectors. And I gave you the example of one complex detector, just a photograph of CMS. And just compare that with the little detector that I showed you from Rutherford's experiment, which was just a combination of a zinc sulfide screen and a little uh, telescope. Okay. So now the question is, how do we know what energies we need to go in these colliders and what precisions we need to aim for? And this is where science and technology together join hands in deciding how we can go forward. For example, in case of Rutherford, the energy of the high energy particles that was required was actually decided by a theory of gamma house theory of alpha decay, which I'm sure many of in the audience would uh, have studied. And this, may, the gamma house theory of alpha decay said that the energy you require to study nuclear processes need to overcome this Coulomb barrier, and therefore the energy should be few million electron volts, and the natural unit there was MeV. And that is the energy that Cockcroft and Walton or uh, the Wilson uh, small cyclotron accelerator actually produced for you. Many decades later, Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg's theory set up the bar for the high energy physics machine by saying that they need to produce the top quark, they need to produce the W and the Z bosons, and they need to produce the Higgs boson so that we can test whether our model is indeed correct. And the energy that was required for that was actually a million times higher than the MeV. So it was giga electrons. Okay. So that is the story that one wants to talk about. So the hand-in-hand -hand development of theory and experiments, you know, that uh, please note that, that everything has to go hand-in-hand. -hand. Sometimes the baton is in one direction, sometimes the baton is in another direction. And finally, this journey has ended in this uh, large hadron collider. And uh, this is the big ring where uh, India actually, as I said, I'm going to tell you how India participated in building of the Large Hadron Collider in, uh, in some ways of the accelerator. So this collides uh, proton beams of 6.5 TeV now. So that is 6,500 GeV and 1 GeV is 1,000 MeV. So we have come, you know, six orders of magnitude from the 1 MeV of Rutherford. And this is the collider which has 6,500 GeV hitting proto of protons, hitting on another beam of protons of 6,500 GeV. And this is the, these uh, rings actually intersect at four points. And one of the intersection point sits the CMS detector. And the, you know, it found the Higgs in 2012. And the Physics Nobel Prize in 2013 was awarded for that discovery. And this discovery would have been impossible without the Large Hadron Collider and the experiments CMS and ATLAS. This is already one mega project that I'm talking about. And the LHC accelerator and the LHC experiments were actually the end station of the journey, which I started, I showed you, began in a small room in 1897 in a small tabletop experiment of Thompson. Now, this experiment at the Large Hadron Collider actually has allowed us to establish the correctness of the standard model of particle physics. And then one says, ah, is that it? Can you all go home now? The journey is over. 
Unfortunately, that is not the case at all, actually. Fortunately, why unfortunately? Because there are many, many observational reasons, some in the world of particles and some which are cosmological, which tell us that there must be physics beyond the physics of the standard model. That means particles and interactions beyond that exist in the standard model must exist. This is an indirect indication from a lot of observed facts which we are not as yet able to explain. Now, why does cosmology come into picture? Because I just said cosmological observations. And that is something, a comment that I had made earlier, that the basic laws of physics that we have studied for the last 100 years at the heart of matter can explain the behavior of matter of all shapes and sizes. Now, the next question was, do these laws of elementary particles, which govern the behavior of the objects at the heart of matter, have anything to say about the cosmic observation? And the answer is really a big yes, and not just in principle, but in practice. Now, what is meant by cosmological distances? Cosmic distances means millions of parsecs. Just to give an idea what one parsec is, it's 200 times the Earth's sun distance. And what is the size of a nucleus? One tenth of a billion billion centimeter. What is the electron size? We don't know, but we believe electron has no size. Even if it has the size, it is less than a billion billion billionth of a meter still. And the knowledge of physics, laws of physics at this distance scale are actually necessary to explain the physics that is that is hap that happens at distances of megaparsec or things that happened at the beginning of the universe. So these, these things that we are discussing, in fact, these ones, the knowledge of physics of the laws can actually, you know, help us answer along with astrophysics and classical physics, particle physics knowledge is required to answer questions such as why do we exist or less dramatically, why does the universe contain so much more matter than antimatter? Why does most of the matter in the universe not shine? We, we don't understand it, but we know for sure that there exists a lot of matter in the universe, which we call the dark matter, simply because it does not shine. And the na last but not the least, we have also found clear evidence that the universe is accelerating. And what is the source of that acceleration? And our understanding of gravitational forces, our understanding of uh, laws of particle physics at the beginning of the universe are all extremely relevant in trying to get some understanding of the answers to these questions. So this interplay of the physics at the micro scale, much smaller than nano actually, and the macro scale, which is the universe scale, this is now driving the understanding of particle physics even further, and those are the cutting edge questions in the subject of particle physics. So what are the observational reasons for BSM, physics beyond standard model? One is that we have direct evidence for non-zero neutrino masses. This got the Nobel Prize in uh, 2015, and Indian Neutrino Observatory would be directly looking at this subject. We have found a light Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider, this was honored by Physics Nobel Prize of 2013. And both the Large Hadron Collider and the International Linear Collider would actually be exploring the questions that are raised by the mass of the Higgs that is found. We feel the force of gravity, but we do not have a quantum description. And these are the questions that are being investigated in the LIGO as well as in the square kilometer array experiment. We know that the dark matter makes up 20% of the universe. This was the Physics Nobel Prize of 2019. And INO may or may not have a solution or probe this issue. Large Hadron Collider can also probe this issue. And some other experiments, which could be in the same cavern as INO, could directly explore this question and really make India Atmanirbhar in the, and make India really proud by trying to make contributions, experimental contributions to answer this very important and burning question. 
we really do need to understand why matter dominates over uh, antimatter in our universe, whereas at the beginning they were equal, and both LHC and INO I have possibilities of addressing some aspect of this question. And then indeed the cosmic acceleration that I mentioned, which was the Physics Nobel Prize of 2011, which is something that both LIGO India and SKA can explore. So what I have shown you here is that there are discoveries, which are Nobel Prize winning discoveries, which have answered a lot of questions, but in fact have raised new questions. And these new questions are something that might be answerable by the experiments that are performed in all these various mega projects. And this micro and macro connection really indicates that we need to think of new uses for the old tools and new tools which are specifically designed for the purpose. And this is the world of astroparticle physics. And all the four mega projects that I am going to be talking about, or I have already talked about, are actually the, pro sub the projects which are on this borderline of you know, general area of astroparticle physics. And why this has, uh, you know, the Large Hadron Collider, for example, I told you it was a microscope to go inside, deep, deep inside matter and probe the structure of matter. But in fact, it's also a telescope in time because the discoveries of the Large Hadron Collider can also be used or the experiments can also be used to actually probe uh, uh, what happened in the universe uh, at the beginning of the universe and particularly, in, you know, this is the Big Bang, the universe started and this is about 10 to the minus 4 seconds after the Big Bang and today we are, you know, 13.8 into 10 to the 9 years after the Big Bang and something happened in this early universe at the Big Bang and the Large Hadron Collider or the uh, Heavy Ion Collider at which both of which in India actually uh, is participating in the experiments and these machines, these experiments actually probe this period in the history of the universe. So this is really the interplay between what happens at the heart of the matter and what happened at the beginning of the universe at uh, billions and billions of years ago or what happens today at the distances of millions of megaparsecs. So now scientists will probe the universe through probes in a range of wavelengths. The optical telescope at Hanley, the radio which is the telescopes of GMRT and the square kilometer array, gravitational waves that is the LIGO, neutrinos that is INO and the colliders which are large hadron colliders and international linear collider. So this is the decade of multi-wavelength, multi-messenger astronomy. So the last half an hour, I hope I have convinced you that the important questions in physics and astrophysics or in science, I would almost say, in the science of the uh, which is looking at the mysteries of universe actually now will be probed through multi-wavelength, multi-messenger uh, experiments. And this is just for fun, I show you that this is the photograph of the sun as it is taken by photons, the regular photograph. And this is a photograph of the sun taken by uh, neutrino observatory because there are when the sun generates energy, it also generates neutrinos. And in fact, these neutrinos get detected on the earth. In fact, experiments with these neutrinos, uh, what provided us a lot of insight into the laws of uh, particle physics and into the physics of the neutrinos. But because of that, this big uh, giant detectors, I will show you one example, actually can sort of tell you what is the position of the sun in the, the sky and that is the position in the sky as shown by beam of neutrinos and you can see the similarity in the two pictures. So this is the sun being looked at through two different messengers and in fact this is indeed the decade of the explorations in particle physics and this connection actually is driving the exploration of the cosmos through the particle physics window as well as through astronomy and astrophysics experiments and these questions 
and much, much more beyond this are actually the science drivers of the LIGO, of SKA and IME, as well as the LHC uh, experiments. Actually, there are plans after the Higgs and the Large Hadron Collider, and particle physicists are thinking of what is called the International Linear Collider, which will be an electron-positron collider, and we are all actually quite excited about that. So now, these are the, I have given you the science justification for these mega science projects. These are mega sizes, mega complexity, and mega, mega expensive. But not just that. It requires million different types of expertise. So the expertise that is required is also mega. So no one person, no one laboratory, no one country can do this anymore. And international collaborations are absolutely essential. So now let me try to give you a little bit of a history of India's participation in each one of these mega projects. Mega project one is CERN and LHC in India. This India CERN collaboration started in about 1999. It's only 25 years old. It was a modest investment of rupees 25 crores over five years. So that means five, five crores per year till about 2004. And LHC required precision machining, precision positioning and measurements. Now, what is meant by precision? Let me give you the example. The proton beams will have to keep true to their path to much less than a micron in traveling over you know distance of 27 kilometers and that traveling at the velocity of light so the magnetic fields which keep the protons in their path have to be very very precise you need precision engineering and india actually made the precision magnet positioning systems called pmps for the large hadron collider and this factory which made them one of them was near here bengaluru and Indian scientists, engineers from BARC, in fact, contributed to the LHC machine magnet testing. India participated in a big way in building the CMS detector, as well as the ALICE detector, of course, in taking the data and analyzing it, so the physics as well. So, in fact, India was invited to be an observer on the CERN Council as a result of these very important contributions of Indian energy engineers and Indian scientists. Over the last few years, India is now an associate member of CERN and has a representation on the CERN Council. And for this, we actually pay into CERN expenses a very small fraction. So how much did we spend? You know, since we are paying a little bit also, how much did we spend? If you look at it, over a period of 20 odd years, we have spent about 210 crores uh, for all, you know, LHC and the experiments. And now we are paying out of this 60 crores per year are actually for the associate membership for the last three years. CERN not only has a let's say experiment, but also has nuclear physics experiments and some of them in nuclear medicine, which are sort of of interest to India. Also, there is an accelerator driven uh, energy program, how to create energy, how to build reactors. Uh, that is also in good progress interest uh, of interest to India. And the, India actually is participating also on future accelerated development and part of it has become possible because now we are an associate member. The second mega project is INO. The, as I said, the 2015 Nobel Prize actually celebrated a fact that neutrinos are masses, but this is something particle physics had known all along for about 20 years before that. And the non-zero mass of the neutrinos actually herald new physics, new particles, and new interaction beyond the standard model of particle physics. So neutrinos right now are subject of intense experimental and theoretical attention. Worldwide, there exists a number of international collaborative neutrino experiments. Now, what happens is that neutrinos actually interact extremely weakly. So they pass through the entire Earth without once interacting, depending, of course, on its energy. So, which means that if a neutrino can pass through the entire Earth without being detected, we really require very, very big detectors. And where do they appear in nature? Actually, they appear everywhere, as I showed you. They come from the sun, they come from supernovae, they come from the cosmic Big Bang that I showed already. They come in the blazars, which are the astrophysical accelerators. 
then there is a earth's crust which gives new neutrinos which is natural radioactivity then nuclear reactors like turbe that is the one we have at turbe then particle accelerators i talked about sun and earth's atmosphere cosmic rays and it is this cosmic ray neutrino experiments and atmospheric neutrino experiments that ino will be engaging itself in now these neutrinos appear in nature they are large in numbers and just to tell you you can calculate the neutrino flux coming from the sun and you will actually find that about 65 million neutrinos pass through your thumbnail every second but because they do not interact at all we don't feel it but they are really large in numbers but it's very difficult to see them they interact very weakly so they are almost an invisible particle like my friend harry potter here it has they vary wearing a cloak of invisibility and how do you remove that cloak of invisibility you do this by doing a waiting game you just keep on watching and sometime somewhere there is going to be a little bit of gap in this cloak and that's what happens so if you have 100 trillion neutrinos per second and if they hit a human body or a size you know person uh, of a size or a body of a human size height human height then we will expect one interaction over 100 years so we cannot wait for 100 years to see one interactions that is more than a lifetime but what you can do is you can make a huge detector which is much much bigger than this human being which is this and then indeed you can there are right now the current big detectors that have been made they are so big that with the 100 trillion trillion neutrinos per second i told you they are uh, so many neutrinos that are coming out with so many trillions of neutrinos you can get about 300 interactions per day and that is the neutrino experimentation in fact india has been a part of this betting game from long long time ago one of the first detections of atmospheric neutrinos was in kolar gold mine in india in 1965 this is the first one of the very first detection of atmospheric neutrinos that i already told you but many things happen other than the neutrino interactions in such detectors and in fact they happen at much uh, bigger rates so we have to get rid of these other things that are happening by going deep underground under the rocks and that means using excavations or using mines and this was in the gold mine a detector that was placed you can even see the clock in the detector and as i said we were there as early as 1965 now we want to do i you know and this i you know i will not go through it i have already sort of given you a birds eye view but this i you know actually would have many many goals in science and these uh, all these goals are something i have already used some of the words for example multi messenger astronomy i already told you then the underground radiation free lab which can be used for other experiments like the dark matter detection experiments so this is a large scale international experiment which will run in india and which can actually develop experimental physics human resource detector development expertise and it can be actually a particle physics education and training hub for students all over india so we are indeed looking forward to ino become a becoming a reality this is our own indian indigenous mega project it uses a technology with magnetic fields which other detectors worldwide have not used so we have an edge even now but that edge is fast disappearing because we proposed it 10 years back the sanction also came about 10 years back only 100 crores out of the sanction 1500 crores have been used for r&d and building a prototype which is running and taking data in madurai the physicists have worked very hard we know we can do the game the goal we can achieve the goal once we build the detector we have demonstrated that by doing pilot experiments and both all the quantities that this detector has sort of edge in determining quantities such as the mass hierarchy of the different types of neutrinos and studying cp violation the detector really has an edge over others and we would really love if this experiment starts going unfortunately the very disheartening are the problems that these experimentalists have been having with 
unlogical obstacles in their path. And at present, they are waiting for the last clearance from the Supreme Court. The National Green Tribunal had cleared it quite a few years back, four years back, but the clearance has been appealed and the, the case has been pending for the last three years almost. And the experiment has actually lost very important time and we really hope that it starts soon and starts doing interesting physics. So I think we have to sort of uh, work very hard in developing scientific temper and scientifically mature society as well. Uh, so that is one part where we need to work if we want these mega projects always to be a reality. And I would say that the other mega projects which followed like LIGO uh, or uh, uh, GMRT actually have learned quite a bit from them. So LIGO India, the history of the theory activity in India started from pioneers like C.V. Vishweshwara or S.V. Dhurandar or Bala Aya. These are a few theories that I can name. And the first gravitational wave detection experiment paper actually had Indian authors because of their theoretical contribution. And this gravitational wave detection actually paper was quoted in the Nobel Prize. So LIGO India has now got to go ahead in 2015. They had been trying it for about a decade almost. And the sanctioned project amount is about 3000 crores over a period of 10 years. And they actually you can, uh, uh, okay, this was, uh, there are actually a lot of popular books. And I liked particularly a book in Marathi on gravitational wave detection, which was written by the ex director of uh, Ayuka, Dr. Ajit Kembavi and my friend, Professor Pushpa Khare, an astrophysicist. So LIGO India actually has a very special advantage. You see, the advanced LIGO US observatories actually detected gravitational waves. They got a Nobel Prize for that. And it had two US detectors, okay? So these two US detectors could actually localize the lakes in the sky, the region from where the gravitational waves came. But if we add LIGO India, then, or if we had LIGO India at that time, they would have been able to locate it in this small region. So therefore, what will happen is that the local sky localization of the sources of gravitational waves will increase you know, and be better, 100 times better, once we have LIGO India that is operational. And here, India's geographical position is actually what makes the contribution really unique. Again, this is a highly multidisciplinary activity and this is going to contribute to development in India for theoretical physics initiatives in general relativity in quantum gravity, as well as uh, neutrino astronomy, that is the INO. And you know, this project has a lot of synergy with, uh, for example, with GMRT, SKA, with AstroSat. And on the other hand, the technology it requires is all cutting edge technology. So this can help India grow in this technology front completely. Then the last but not the least is the mega project, which is the radio astronomy square kilometer array. And as I said, it is actually just the next step in the giant meter wave radio telescope, GMRT, which was built near Pune. And GMRT was built in 1981 to 1998. And its architect was Dr. Govind Swaroop. This was built for about 50 years, over 20 uh, crores, over 20 years. It delivered exciting, important science. And international scientists right now buy time to do experiments with the same facility. But it has also established the credentials of the Indian scientists in the field. It is now being upgraded. It was built for 50 crores. The upgrade requires about 100 crores. And the point is that an project at the level of SK was actually envisioned by somebody like Dr. Govind Swaroop already, and that is the necessary next step. So GMRT has been a pathfinder, as it were, for this big project. And so far, we have spent about 70 crores in seven years for developmental work, and now they are awaiting a sanction of extra 1,000 crores, which will be spread over a period of 10 years. So these are actually, you know, what has Indian groups done? The Indian groups have actually helping develop the brain of this project, the telescope manager system, and how to collect data from different antenna and put them together at uh, in real time. And when the experiment runs and run, India would be a member, India will be responsible for the running of the telescope 
and will be playing a very important role in the data analysis. This means developmental opportunities for the young in AI and machine learning and so on and so forth. And due to our experience in GMRT and upgrade of GMRT, the Indian community can really be well placed, is really well placed to reap also giant physics dividends out of this. So this is really what these four mega projects are. They are all very exciting. They are going to do exciting physics. Indian physicists have a pedigree. Indian physicists have experience and Indian physicists have been invited because of their experience. So as you can see, these mega projects are endeavors to seek answers to fundamental questions. Indian scientific community has earned its place in these mega projects. And now I think it needs the Rajashraya, the support from the state to take that rightful place in these mega projects, which are international. The community has made important contributions in the area. GMRT has been the pathfinder for SK. Theorists and, uh, have made pioneering contributions to the subject of gravitational wave detection. And the particle physics community actually boasts of one of the earliest detection of the atmospheric neutrinos at KGF. And neutrino physicists are actually wanting to build a mega physics facility in India where outsiders will come to partake the advantages of this facility. We are no longer a developing country. We have both the intellectual and the technical and the financial capital. We can actually take our rightful place in the, the world scientific scene after the 75 years of independence. And one way is by building the national mega projects like INO and participating in the international pro mega projects. And the international community is now inviting our participation, not just because uh, for the funds, of course funds are essential, but it is really inviting us for the science that we can contribute. You know, unfortunately, this is where there is a small problem. The human resource in R&D per million in India right now, per million, there is only 200 to 300 which work in science. And in USA, it's 4,500 per million. And in China, it's 1,500 per million. And the numbers I've taken from UNESCO Statistics Institute. The development of trained scientific HR is very, very important for the country's progress. The mega projects will actually provide the focal point for this development of human resource. And mission-oriented projects like DAE, the DRDO, ISRO have had, have actually done this. So they taught, show us that the mega projects actually provide a focus for a very focused development of human resource. For example, LIGO actually uses laser technology and India can become a leader in laser technology. And the potential technology spin-offs will impact quantum computing, quantum Q distributions for secure communications. You speak of it. New ground for optics and communication technology in India will be broken. Cold atom labs, precision force measurements. You think of it and you realize that this technology will be useful and contribute to progress in uh, pure science and many, many different fronts. And it has the potential to draw our smart Indian undergrad students and who are typically interested in theoretical physics into the experimental science because the question that this experimental science is asking are very, very fundamental. There is also technology gain. I will give you examples not of India, but about in general. For example, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN and it has changed our lives forever. I cannot even imagine what life would have been like for the last two years of pandemic had it not been for the web. I would not be giving you this seminar without the web. Development of imaging crystals for particle detectors actually led us to PET scanners. Development of electronics to high magnetic field actually to read out the crystals has now led to the development of a new scanner which will combine advantages of MRI and PET. So, you know, human health initiatives get contributions from these mega projects. Due to India's participation in experiments at CERN, Indian groups have, you know, Indian groups have developed indigenously data acquisition chips which have been used in the CERN experiment. Now, this knowledge of data acquisition chip production can actually find other applications in other technological area in India. Technology gains from very esoteric, you know, basic science. General theory of relativity is essential for GPS to work. Michael Faraday actually very, very long time back in answer to William Gladstone's experiment, a question about utility of the newfangled blue sky research on electricity had said, sir, one day you will tax it. 
development of semiconductors lasers masers you know which are very very important technologically were all discovered in curiosity driven research formal developments in number theory or quantum mechanics are actually useful for developments in quantum information cryptology and so on and so forth sometimes the time gap between basic science development and their technological applications are very large and not every fundamental theoretical development will lead to the application for mankind and society but the potential is always there we need to be patient so you know the usual uh, debate that people have whether we should be focusing on blue sky research whether we should be focusing on applied research the former cern dg actually said that governments often speak of basic and applied science as if we have a choice and i think what i have tried to convey to you and what he says is that we do not have a choice the two form part of a virtuous circle that we interrupt at our peril we need both if we are to lay the foundations for future prosperity and we need to ensure that the knowledge is shared between the two and india's participation in mega projects at home and outside is almost essential so that we can lay foundations to the future prosperity of india and have atmanirbhar so pure research for example i can give you an example pure research by our colleagues on coronaviruses was extremely useful <coughs> excuse me as the, they they got did got translated into vaccine development <coughs> within a short manner of a month, few months of course country doesn't have infinite resources and a country like india we, uh, so far all the mega projects have been actually entry into them has been driven by personalities but now as a country we will have to develop processes by which the community can make a decision community can set priorities and also arrive at what are the minimal needs consistent with india's relevance for the mega project and relevance of the mega project to indian science and society japan usa actually europe has such systems in place and in fact india's discussion in the snt expenditures and the various plans and now the snt policy step 2021 has included discussions on the mega science projects in the same vein and things are moving i think the future is bright we have a long way to go but we all hope that there is a very bright goal which we will reach at the end of our journey thank you very much for being very patient <laughs> Uh, thank you very much madam uh, for this elucidative talk and it is indeed a knowledge sharing session for the entire audience your talk has made us dive deep into the cosmos and understanding of dark matter we have witnessed the entire gamut of elementary physics in one talk and also india's contribution towards large hadron collider in developing its precision magnet position uh, positioning system and our country's participation on future accelerated developments at CERN and development of different mega projects, quoting the Atmanirbhar in science. I once again thank you very much, ma'am, for this intellectualizing lecture. Now I request a honorable director, D. K. Sinha sir, to felicitate the speaker of this afternoon, Professor Rohini Godbole, with the memento, virtually as a mark of admiration for her contribution in the field of elementary physics. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. Now I request additional director, research and development, and secretary, INS Hyderabad chapter, Dr. T. S. Sunil Kumar, to propose the vote of thanks. Good evening. Uh, indeed. I am overwhelmed by words because personally I feel I was I am right now out of a classroom, classroom where I long back I sat in a classroom, a post graduation classroom, where I could get <laughs> avalanche of information, particularly on particle physics, and the concepts about the policy for science and science for policy, because what is the what is the requirements, including the include the policy matters. towards developing the techniques and uh, mega sciences my science projects to be implemented here thank you madam because we bring taking us back to the classroom so that we we get reoriented and rejuvenated towards the mission towards implementing the science projects in india and on behalf of 
INS Hyderabad branch particularly and AMD, on behalf of all the members, I express our great um, and thanks to you for accepting our invitation and giving us a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. Thank this you. program attended by many people, uh, both virtually and physically, physically with us, Dr. N. Sai Baba, Raja, Raja Ramana Fellow, and uh, uh, former CE NFC is with us here. Yes. And so yes. also former uh, regional directors and additional di uh, former directors, additional directors and regional directors of AMD are virtually available, including Sri Dimesh Kumar, P. Krishnamurthy, and former CE NFC, R. N. Jairaj sir is online with us, and uh, present additional chief executive, Dr. Pramanik is with us in the NFC, he's along with us, and also the additional directors, Charavanan and Mamalan, Mamalan, all the regional directors. We, Madam, we have got seven regions and different parts of the country where we are carrying out exploration, and all the regional directors and their colleagues are online I'm with thankful. us. I'm thankful to you, sirs. Uh, and uh, not only that, we have taken this as a part of our public outreach program. So we have uh, shared this uh, web link with so many institutes, colleges, and they have, some of them have also joined. On behalf of all the INS members here, I thank all the participants for this function. This function has been made uh, successful by my by INS Hyderabad branch, particularly the EC committee. EC, I thank one of them, one and all. We'll be meeting again for the next function next month, maybe in the fourth fourth week of uh, March. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. And I will now... Uh, 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 just a minute. Uh, with ah, this, we have come to the end of the uh, today's invited talk. Uh, before we conclude the program, uh, let us stand for the national anthem. Oh, yes. Thank you. My apologies for forgetting it. everybody and bye 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 i request all the senior officials and staff mm -hmm. present in this auditorium for a cup of tea in the adjacent lawns <laughs>